A new agent adjusts to the routine abnormal. A troubled soul sees reality more clearly than those around him. The natural world is betrayed by being an accomplice to kidnapping. Welcome to Hidden Oaks. Agent Wilker, welcome back. Got your sandwich. Thanks. Uh, uh, uh. Thank you, Agent Matson, sir. <laughs> Just giving you shit, kid. Here. Hey, first full week in the field, right? Mm-hmm. Eh, sorry. Isn't that always the way it goes? You're at a restaurant, they give you your food, wait till you've got your face stuffed, and then ask, so how is everything? Dennis, too, they got their hands literally in your mouth. And then make with a small talk, asking if you got big weekend plans or some shit. That happened to you? Mm hmm. <laughs> Damn it. Well, whatever. You know what I mean, clearly. You know, I barely remember my first week. Probably right here or close enough. The only real difference is I never get onions for my sandwich. Uh, you didn't on this one either. Shit. Sorry. Force of habit, I suppose. Eh. You know what? I do remember my first week, but I wasn't watching the park. They had me out with, uh, what was his name? He's not here anymore, uh, Agent Crispin. Talk your fucking ear off. Smart as fuck, but, well, not so smart about when and where to babble for hours on end. And don't say it. Don't you dare say it. I know I'm a talker myself, but trust me, this dude was on a whole different level. Man, I haven't thought about him in a while. Kind of weird, squeaky voice, too. Kind of sounded fruity, to be honest. Not that I judge. He did have a really good piece of advice, mine. When I was just starting out. In this line of work, he told me, there are going to be surprises. You'll be doing whatever, sitting here munching on your lunch, and boom. Just like that, your world will change. You can't... How do you put it? Something like you can't be specifically ready for what comes next. But you gotta be ready at a moment's notice to drop whatever came before. That's good. Yeah, and he was right. No, I mean this cheese. You... Uh, <laughs> nice. Well played. Thanks. Really, though, I suppose that's true. Uh, where is he now? No idea. He left about a half a year after I started. I don't think he contacted any of us since. Well, that's probably just about enough about days long gone. What about today? Anything new? No... There was another bunch of kids, but they bolted the second they saw me. Is that why we dress like this? What, you don't like the suits? I didn't say that. It just seems kind of, uh, I don't know, on the nose? Exactly. If you're going to have agents out in public, agents of an organization that doesn't exist, who sometimes need to lay some shit down about who is allowed to do what and where, you might as well look the part. Yeah, I still don't get how that keeps anything secret. If we rub somebody the wrong way, say some civil liberties type gets all bent out of shape because we won't let him through a hot zone on a certain day, they're going to complain about what? The men in black? A pair of secret service looking dudes in a black sedan? It sounds crazy, and if something sounds crazy, most people won't bother to say it. And if somebody does, then they just sound crazy anyways. Exactly. Yeah, but... Everyone else around here, they've all seen us too. Doesn't matter. Still sounds crazy. Most people don't volunteer to also sound crazy. Look, you're not wrong exactly. Things do sometimes get out of hand. People have managed to make a fuss sometimes. But you'd be surprised how much less that happens now that we're dressed like this. Actually, DC Branch always looked this way. The rest didn't realize it would go over just as well anywhere. So, this is new? No... That all happened before I joined. I mean, new-ish, I suppose. 70s, I think. 
Actually, I've heard parts of the Inner Mountain Branch dress like Mormon missionaries, if they're young enough. Don't know if that's true. Uh, LDS. What? Latter-day Saints. That's what the Mormons prefer to be called. How the fuck do you know that? My neighbor's LDS. And has a lisp, actually. Not sure if it's fruity or not. All right. You're gonna keep me on my toes, aren't you? I like that. In which case, I got a question for you. Mm Mm-hmm. So, lowly grunts like us don't get to see everything, right? Classification, clearance levels, stuff's on a need-to-know basis. But we're not idiots. We see shit. We piece shit together. So what do you think about Area 51? Like, Roswell? Is, uh, is that us? (laughs) You tell me. I, uh... (laughs) Alright, don't strain yourself. I was just curious. That was one of the first things that went through my head when I started. Hmm. And? And what? And what about it? Area 51. I'll tell you when you need to know. Uh Uh-huh. I should have seen that one coming. Speaking of which, one o'clock. What? I don't... Right through there. Skin. I think our cartographer showed up again. Surveyor, I think. What? What's the difference? I... Who cares? That's the surveyor, right? Or was? Yeah, pretty sure. Uh, Should we go in? No. No. It's not yet. That reminds me, though. We still have the clothes in the trunk. I was going to drop those off at the lab. You started a report already, right? You mentioned the surveyor? Yeah, except I put cartographer, because that's what you said. That's not... My point is, you'll want to add a note that they're still hanging around. Could mean there's a new player in the mix. A new player? Yeah, you know that big board in the commander's office? She's got like a hundred things up there, some of them with huge piles of notes around them. Yeah, I know what you mean. I just wouldn't have thought this surveyor had anything to do with... anything. Well, that's the job, right? We report, we collect information. Whether it means something or not, that's someone else's problem. Those hundred names and things up on Mirror's board, those are the pieces on the chessboard, or at least they might be. We don't decide what moves are played, we see what's happening and report back. Okay, I get the point. Alright, good. (sighs) There's also a bigger point right now. The board is setting up, gathering its pieces. Pretty soon, the game starts. Then the opening moves will be made. If either side isn't paying attention when that happens, things will go sideways real quick. Hold up. So the players are also the pieces? Wouldn't the players just be... Come on, you know what And what are we? The pawns? Shut up. We're not anything. I mean, we're not on the board. We're not... Look, maybe it's not the perfect metaphor, all right? But trust me, you're going to have to think about this stuff in an abstract way. All right. Sorry, What? Nothing. No, you've got that whole world's worst poker face got one more thing to say thing going on. Spit it out. I think you're using analogy, not metaphor. Well, all right then. You be sure and spend a page or two of your report going over the difference between a metaphor and an analogy and a cartographer and a whatever. Don't say it. Surveyor. (sighs) Where the hell was I? The pieces are going to start moving. Right. See, is that so hard? Just play along for a minute? Anyway, what we're dealing with on one side of the board is people, humans. On the other, we've got something else entirely. After this cycle, when you've seen some shit, you can have a big, long, pandemic talk about what word to use. But it doesn't matter what it's called. What matters is it doesn't win. If it's so dangerous and has these dormant times or whatever, why don't we take it out then? Why wait to play its game on its terms, on its own board? Well, now you're talking, see? But there are two problems with that. First, it doesn't work. Trust me, I've seen people die trying. Second, that isn't the deal. What we're aiming for is a stalemate. If what we want is to not have a massacre on our hands, and it is, then the game needs to be played through to the end without a winner. Is that what they mean by Order Zero? Yeah, that's right. Order zero. We do not interfere. That's the deal. That's our contract with this thing. We see an innocent bystander getting too snoopy or about to get themselves killed, we nudge him away. That's more or less what we've been doing this week. But when the board is set and a move is being played, we do not jump in and swat the pieces away. We let the game happen. 
you said you've seen people die anyways? Yeah. Before Mira, we were under Friedman's command. He, uh, he had a pretty loose definition of what counted as interference. We were tilting the board the whole game, hoping the other side wouldn't notice. It looked like the human side won. We thought the cycle was over, and everybody was... Anyway, it wasn't over. That wasn't the deal, and there was a price. A shit ton of people died. Agents, civilians, shit ton of people. We all would have died if it hadn't been for Mira. I don't even know how she did it. It was like a fucking war zone, even out here. But in she goes, no weapon, no radio, and by the time she comes out, everything had stopped. Anytime anybody asked what happened, all she said was, Order Zero. So she was put in charge? Yep. It was pretty clear to everyone left. We were done doing things Friedman's way. Friedman? The guy from the lab? The guy who got a bunch of people killed, he's still here? He's a good engineer. He knew he fucked up. He wasn't some power-tripping psycho or anything. He just made some shitty calls. He wasn't a leader. At least not a good one. When was all this? I mean, I grew up like one town away. I never heard about a ton of people dying. Then that was the other half of why that cycle sucked so much. You wouldn't believe what it takes to cover up something like that. And here's genuinely fucking hoping you never have to find out. Yeah, you'd remember. You... You would have heard, but you didn't. Part of the job. God, the paperwork alone? Fuck. Seriously, you can't imagine. Okay. I'm gonna say Area 51 is not us. Well, don't just guess. We shoot the shit for a few minutes and suddenly... Mm, page f from shit. What? Fuck. <clears throat> Tupperware, cardiac arrest... Surgery underway. Stand by. What does that mean? Is uh, Tupperware one of the pieces or players or whatever? <sighs> hey, Matson. Yeah, um, yeah. Tupperware is basically the main player. The containment ritual, it's a family thing. The head of the family is responsible for the rights each cycle. And he, uh, she? He. He had a heart attack? Hold up. Is he seriously called Tupperware? Because he does the containment ritual? Hmm? Oh, <laughs> I haven't thought about that in forever. Actually, that was one of a bunch of code names Friedman came up with. Uh, Tupperware? Yeah, he was proud of that one, too, because, like you say, containment, uh, and back then the guy also partied with ladies, and what else? He'd lose his top? Got something else, too. Probably wasn't a microwave safe or some shit. I don't remember. And without him, what? Do we have to go through some ritual ourselves? Oh, no, no. That we can't do. Uh, name a cliche about blood. What? Blood lines. Blood is thicker than water, blood relatives, anything you can think of about blood. I don't know. A contract written in blood? All right. So who's on the nose now? In any case, within our little arrangement, anything to do with blood, all that shit is taken seriously. Why that particular bloodline is so special? I don't know. But only the family does the ritual. Only the family knows the ritual. That part, non-negotiable. If we go out of bounds... Let me guess. Blood? Blood. Anyway, this guy, to the best of our knowledge, has not exactly been prepping the next of his bloodline about all this. We might be wrong about it, but I suppose we'll find out soon enough. So, what'd you do before this? Hmm? Oh, a, a little of everything. I worked for my dad at the police station right out of school, but then he died. Yeah, sorry, man. Thanks. Uh, let's see, after that I set up computer networks at schools and stuff, just kind of around the area. Got it. Anything goes wrong with our printer or whatever, I send you in. I'd rather you didn't. You guys, well, we are running NT for some stupid reason. I don't know what that means. For anything serious, you really need netware. Or, better yet... Don't care either. Right. Sorry, just, uh... You used to do computer networking. Yeah, for a little while. Then the county or the school board or whatever got a contract for all that stuff, and the outfit they signed with. I interviewed there, they said I got the job, but before I even started, they got bought out by someone else. And that office was shut down. Let's see, I ran deliveries for a while after that. The head of that company got arrested for some kind of fraud. 
I worked for a little stock photo and publishing place. Pretty good deal there. One of the guys left and started his own company out west somewhere. Asked me to go with, but uh, I didn't want to move. Anyway, you know, this and that. A lot of jobs that fell through for one reason or another. I should have brought my little magnetic chessboard. What? It folds up, keeps all the pieces in it. I should keep it here in the glove box. I don't play chess. You... Okay, I call bullshit. I'm serious. No way. You had this whole belabored analogy. You talked about opening moves. So? You play chess. Come on, the jig is up. Nope. Fine. And so much for you being a talker either. What is it about this? What's the guy's name? I don't want to call him Tupperware. (laughs) I actually don't remember. Not sure I ever knew. The family's important, right? Do we not throw around a family name? I told you, you'll be a lot better off if you think about this stuff in the abstract. There's a reason we use code names, even silly ones. Especially silly ones. Well, whatever. Clearly, you're non-abstractly shaken. I just want to know what's going on. What's going on? Uh, You ever been in a car accident when someone else is driving? Or maybe you were, but the road was all icy and you had no control over anything? Yeah, actually, one of each. Maybe for you it was different, but for me, time kind of slows down. You don't know for sure if that anything bad is going to happen, but it feels like all the paths that lead to anything turning out okay are all passing by, one after another. Every little fraction of a second, your chances get worse. If someone were to check in with you right then and ask, Hey, what exactly are you worried about right now? Would you have a properly worded answer for that? Tupperware alive, all agents to HQ ASAP. Well, well, then all hands. Is that bad? It's not normal. All right, Agent Wilker, buckle it up. Ready to let go of what came before? It had been several years since Derek had seen the men in the black sedans. They would follow him everywhere he went. They would watch him, take notes about him, keep track of everything he did. It didn't matter where he went, what he was doing, who he was with. They would invariably turn up. It started out with one car, two occupants parked down the street from his house. Sometimes it would be there, sometimes it wouldn't. But over time it increased and the men became more menacing. He started to hear their voices over their radios, but they were projecting into his head. They would talk about him, then they started to talk to him. They told him awful and dark things. He knew they were bad. He knew they were out to get him. It got to the point where he couldn't focus on anything else and it started to affect his life significantly after this. It was difficult for him to sleep at night, knowing that the men in the black suits and the black sedans were parked outside, listening to him, tracking his life, his thoughts, and his dreams. Because of his lack of sleep every night, his daily functioning took a steady downfall, and his paranoia greatly increased. He would wake up late for work, and he was often made even more late by the fact that he would have to take long, circuitous routes to avoid the men in the black sedans from following him. But they would turn up, and be outside his office, still listening, still watching, still broadcasting their radio babble into his mind. He began to drink bourbon and vodka to help him get to sleep at night and to calm his mind, his racing thoughts, his anxiety, and his fears. He knew if he kept turning up late to work, he wouldn't be able to keep his job. His boss was already complaining about how often he was tardy. The day that he couldn't stop himself from explaining the reason didn't seem to help. When he told his boss about the men in the black sedans, he just looked uncomfortable and maybe even kind of afraid of Derek. A week after that, he was fired. No reason was given. He was just told to clean out his desk and security escorted him off the property. The short version of it is that, for a few years, his drinking got worse. Sometimes he never slept at all. He couldn't keep a job and he eventually lost his house. He didn't have many friends, definitely not any close friends. 
The drinking stopped helping, and eventually he turned to various drugs he could get on the street to try to make the men in the sedans go away. Occasionally he would panic, or get angry, and then would end up in the custody of the police, or in an ER, on an emergency hold. Eventually, after an inpatient stay at Abbott Northwestern Hospital downtown, he was referred to the care of a psychiatrist who helped him understand, and who Derek believed saved his life. Auditory and visual hallucinations. Paranoid delusions. This is what the men in the sedans were. This was part of his psychosis, one of the primary features of his diagnosis, schizophrenia. The doctor explained all this to Derek and told him he could help him with medications to make these things go away. Derek continued to take the medications as they were prescribed to him. His brother Elliot and his wife Sarah were kind enough to let him stay with them in their home in New Brighton. They paid him to do some work around the house, and he also worked every weekend at the gas station down the street. Since Derek had been on the medication, the men in the cars, the drinking, and the drugs were all something that was now years in his past. Until several days ago. That is when the men in the black sedans returned. They came up just as they did before. One day, when Derek had just finished vacuuming the living room, he looked out the window, to his surprise, to see two men in sunglasses and black suits get out of a black sedan across the street, right next to Hidden Oaks Park. They were looking at a state survey truck that had been parked on the side of the road, but he felt the old feeling of paranoia creep into the back of his mind. They're watching you, Derek. A feeling of panic washed over Derek just then. He thought this part of his life was behind him. He had never really thought that the medication would stop working. Could the hallucinations just come right back like this, out of the blue? He called his psychiatrist that first day and his medication dose was increased a little. One of the benefits and curses of this was that he was even more drowsy than usual. He could sleep better, but he was less able to be vigilant and observant during the day which made him worried about the men in the sedans. He did his best, and he kept notes in his journal. In spite of his medication increase, he had continued to see them every day since then, too. Often during the day when most of the neighbors were at work, or at night when people were asleep. This time, it did feel a bit different, though. He never did hear the radio static in his head, but he did hear it on the TV and over the actual radio sometimes, he thought. On top of that, The longer this went on, the men in the sedans really didn't seem to be paying attention to him either. He started to stay up late to watch them so he could keep tabs on them, keeping tabs on whatever it was they were keeping tabs on. After a time, Derek stopped doubting the reality of the men in the sedans. Just as all those years before, he began to believe that they were really out there, and they were really up to something no good. The evening he came to this conclusion, he told his brother about them. His brother just had a worried, concerned look on his face and didn't say much. He asked Derek if he had spoken to Dr. Bray. Derek said that he had and that his medication had already been increased. His brother asked him a lot of questions then that made him feel childish and embarrassed. It was already hard enough to know that everyone that knew him or cared about him didn't believe what he was saying or thought he was crazy. But to have to go through the barrage of questions like, Have you been sleeping and eating? Have you been drinking? Doing any drugs again? You can be honest with me, Derek. I care about you. I just want to help. Really just ratcheted up the shame and embarrassment to another level. After that, Derek stopped sharing what he saw. He knew no one would believe him. Hell, even he still wasn't 100% sure that he believed it himself until the night before last. Everyone was asleep, and he was sitting in the living room looking out the big picture window thinking about life, what was real, and trying to wind down his mind so he could go to sleep. A thunderstorm had raged earlier that evening, but had since abated. Now the sky was clearing and the moon was visible through the remaining wisps of clouds. He was looking across the street into the moonlit trees lost in thought when his attention was caught by something moving across the road. He stood up, went over to the window, and that's when he saw more clearly the form of a young girl, maybe early teens. He couldn't make out exactly 
who it was even though there was some moonlight. She was lying down but just seemed to be casually dragged or hovered across the road and into the trees of hidden oaks, being entirely swallowed up by their branches. Then, for a few minutes there was nothing, nothing but a vague sense of unease. Some time passed, perhaps hours, before the black sedan with two men in black suits pulled up to the spot where the girl had entered the woods. They sat there a while, and then after getting out and having a conversation, they walked to the trunk of the car, pulled out something vague and dark, and walked into the woods just where the girl had entered them. Not long after, they returned, but this time what they were carrying looked cumbersome. It looked a lot like a body wrapped in a rug or a tarp. Of this, to Derek, there was little doubt. And all doubt was shattered when, after heaving the thing into the trunk, one of the men bent down and picked something up off the ground and tossed it into the trunk, too. That looked like a tennis shoe, Derek thought. In fact, I'm sure that was a tennis shoe. Then the men drove away. Derek started to panic. There is no way he could get any sleep now. It seemed like everything he could do just to catch his breath. His world was falling apart around him again. He didn't think this was a hallucination. Dr. Bray couldn't help with this. He paced the living room for several minutes, mind and heart racing. In a flash of impulse, he hurried to the cupboard above the refrigerator where he knew his brother kept the liquor. He pulled down a bottle of bourbon and grabbed a glass with a shaky hand. He pulled the cork and was about to pour, already feeling the burn in his throat, the relaxation wash over him, the numbing of his mind and the sleepiness that he knew would come. He wouldn't care about the men in the sedans or the tarp or the tennis shoe. He could just forget all about it at the bottom of this bottle. But he stopped. He knew that he believed his eyes this time. He knew that he had to stay sober, stay calm, and think. No one would believe him most likely in general, but they definitely wouldn't if he started drinking again, too. He worked too hard to get to this point in his life. He set the bottle down and stared at it for a minute, then two minutes. He replaced the cork, put the glass and bottle back in the cupboard, and walked slowly and shakily to bed. He lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, thinking about what he saw and what to do. By 7 a.m. he knew what he was going to do. He listened for his brother and sister-in-law to leave for work for the day. Then he got out of bed, got dressed, and left the house with conviction. He made a direct path to the police department to report what he had seen. He got to sit in a small room with an officer and tell his whole story. He told about the men in the sedans that were watching things. He told about how they were coming more and more often. He told about the radio static on his TV and radio. He told about the girl gliding into the woods and the men putting the tarp into the trunk of the car. He told about the tennis shoe. He had known they wouldn't believe him. How many times had they seen him at his worst? How many times had they picked him up when he was psychotic or drunk or high out of his mind or all three? Nobody believed him. Nobody but himself, and even that wasn't wholeheartedly. At least the officer didn't laugh at him or just dismiss him out of hand. That actually made him feel a little worse. It made him feel pitied. The cop just listened, wrote down hardly anything, and at the end, the only questions he asked were the same ones that his brother had. Have you been taking your meds, Derek? Have you been drinking? Using drugs again? Derek felt so ashamed, so afraid, worried, angered, unsupported, and alone. Alone in the world to face what he wasn't entirely sure was real or not. He felt handled by everyone around him. They just talked to him like he was someone they had to deal with, not like a person. And none of it, none of it, helped him with the problems he was facing. He had no idea where to turn, but he knew he would just have to keep it all to himself again now. It wasn't going to get any different. He had calmed himself with reason again as he walked around the corner onto his street. He was lost in thought, looking down as he walked, and when he looked up, he froze. The panic came back tenfold into his mind. There, parked across the street from his house, was a black sedan. 
and he stared and stood completely still. One thought dawned on him. The men in the suits were not in the car. He seized this opportunity and walked briskly up to it, fighting his terror. There on the ground outside the passenger window he saw the sunflower seed shells as if someone in that seat had been sitting there spitting them out the window. When he looked into the car he saw the crumpled up fast food bag on the floor and the soda bottle in the cup holder. When he reached out, he gently pressed a not exactly steady hand against the door of the car and he felt it. This car was real. As he touched it, a gruff voice said in a stern tone, Hey, step away from the car, okay? When Derek turned around, two men in sunglasses and black suits were emerging from the edge of the trees and walking toward him. He said nothing in reply, but simply ran into his brother's house and locked the door. He stood there panting for a few seconds and looked out the peephole. The men had not followed him, but they were still out there, sitting in the car now, watching, waiting. Derek staggered his way into the kitchen and pulled out the bourbon. This time he didn't bother grabbing a glass, he just tore out the cork and started taking long pulls directly from the bottle. It was only a matter of minutes before he felt the waves of calm start to wash over him. He took the bourbon with him as he went into the bathroom and flushed all that was left of his medications down the toilet. He knew he wasn't going to be taking them anymore. When he finished the bourbon he went back to the kitchen and took down the vodka and then the rum. He finished them all, in the basement corner behind the furnace, sitting on the floor with his knees pulled up to his chest, his face and shirt wet with the tears that had come for hours. In the deepest, darkest parts of his brain, he always knew this life would come back. He hated it. He feared it. And he didn't know what else to do. The men in the black sedans would follow him forever. They came for Aubrey every night. It wouldn't always be the same. A few times she'd see them around her room, on the floor, between piles of clothes, beneath blankets, or even sandwiched in the pages of a comic book. Those were the moments she tried to pretend this wasn't happening to her. That the bugs weren't trying to take her away while she slept, like they were just lost, confused, and randomly interested in her presence. She wanted to pretend that she wasn't special to them, a magnet for their wriggling legs and darting bodies. She was, though. Sometimes Aubrey would stay up until the sun rose, blasting music through her discman, reading manga, or simply staring at the ceiling. The longer the darkness was there, the stranger her room would become. Even with all the lights on, her bedroom was hot and stifling, but she was too afraid to open a window to release the summer heat. They might be coming in that way. She also stuffed towels beneath her door. They were jammed in like pieces of flesh. In fact, Aubrey was desperate enough for her solitude that the concept of using her own body to block the door was also an option. They always got in, though. Always. The first few nights of this abduction, Aubrey would try to kill as many bugs as she could when they entered her room. She'd stomp around in her winter boots and swat at them with heavy books she'd dug out of her mom's belongings in the basement. For once, Aubrey was slightly glad her father was an alcoholic. He would either not be home or would be passed out so deeply that he couldn't hear her thrashing about. The skirmishes with the insects never lasted very long. They learned quickly and would hide throughout the house until Aubrey finally fell asleep. She was usually sitting up in her bed holding a battered picture frame with a photograph of her mother smiling from inside. It was only on the first night that she'd had the dream about the bridge. It stuck with her. The curl of rock sitting over the water was like some sort of eye watching her. To what it belonged, Aubrey did not know, but it bled into her thoughts often. At any point of the day, as she tried to distract herself from the kidnapping attempts, the yellow fields would beam into her eyes. The smell of sweet wildflower would drip into her nose. The din of wild insects would deafen her. And then the bridge would uncurl like a sleeping insect and spring across the water in a cobblestone flourish. She'd shake her head, and the vision would go away, but not for long. 
It was with a similar routine that she'd be dragged to Hidden Oaks Park. They'd sneak her down the driveway, across the streets, and through the forests. This would happen in the deepest moments of night, when nothing of the human world wandered. She'd be in complete disbelief about it. Worse, the trauma she was going through was still going unnoticed by anyone in the neighborhood. After Aubrey had twisted free of the bugs and the pain inside her arm, she'd stand up and paw at her body to get free of her torturers. She'd spit the dew and grass out of her mouth, then start crying. She'd sob the entire way home, drifting from the curb to the center of the road. At times, she wished a car would hit her in the gloom, but nothing ever moved in those early hours of morning. She was alone, even though people filled in quiet houses all around her. In her head, Aubrey went over how she could tell someone what was happening to her every night. She imagined how Ty or Clement would react to her confusion. They blindly followed her because she happened to be the only female friend they had, but they didn't actually listen to her about anything. Telling them that a species of bug was haunting her and constantly dragging her out of her home in the middle of the night wasn't a very easy thing to communicate, even to someone who was actually listening. It didn't matter. These visitations were horrifying in every sense of the word. She was going to have to tell someone about it. She was hoping her father would simply ask. He had seen her plenty of times since it all started. She'd barely slept. She'd lost weight. Her skin had a sickish gray hue to it. Her eyes had seemingly sunken down into her face as the circles underneath them spread like pools of oil. Whenever she walked anywhere, she staggered, like her waist had a chain around it tied to some nightmarish entity that she couldn't see or understand. Beyond her obvious distress, Ricky, their dog, was too afraid to come up from the basement. Her father couldn't lure him out with anything. He even tried to feed him a burger he'd brought home for him from Joe DiMaggio's, but that didn't entice him either. What's wrong with this damn dog? He won't come out of the basement. I don't get it. He's never been scared of anything. Hell, that's why I got him, her father said. He'd pace across the floor, stopping occasionally to stare into the basement, looking for the animal. Her father was a short, chubby man with a long, gray hair that sat on his shoulders. His face was round and hidden beneath a gray beard. His eyes were brown and nearly swollen shut with rows of dehydrated wrinkles forged from years of alcohol abuse. He always wore a green trucker's hat, which said Honeywell in white letters. He dressed in a gray shirt with holes in the armpits. On the ninth night of these kidnappings, she finally decided to tell him what was happening. There was a thunderstorm boiling in the sky just north of their house, throwing echoing bits of vibrating thunder into the walls and scorching the sky in tendrils of purple fire. Her dad had come home early from Joe DiMaggio's, most likely to outrun the storm. He was sitting on the couch in the living room, watching an episode of Law and Order. Aubrey approached him slowly, holding her bandaged hand like it might stabilize her as she spoke to him. Dad, she said to him. He didn't reply. Dad, can I talk to you a second? She asked. What? What is it? Can't you see I'm watching my programs? He replied with a snarl, but without averting his eyes from the glowing television screen. I know. I'm sorry. I just am a little worried right now about my hand. I hurt it over a week ago and it really hasn't gotten better, she said while staring at the floor. She was wearing a red shirt with jeans. Her hair was loose and dirty. She was too scared to take a shower. Your hand? What happened with that? What are you talking about? He said, leaning over the couch to look at her. He narrowed his eyes and shook his head. How come I'm just hearing about this now, right when I'm trying to relax? Do I need to take you to urgent care? Yeah, maybe, she said. What happened to it? Did you fall off your bike or something? No, no... I actually got bit by a cat. Her father leaned over even farther. What? He said. I got bit by a cat in those woods by hidden oaks, she said. Right by the playground? Where you and all those shitholes hang out? Yeah, there. What were you doing there? I don't want you hanging out in that park. Just messing with some kids. And some random cat came up and just bit you? I thought it was dead. I was standing over it, sort of, and it jumped up and got me. Her father laughed. 
<laughs> Serves you right. We'll go look at it tomorrow afternoon when I'm off work. I'm not taking any time off for this stupid shit. He leaned back on the couch and shook his head. Aubrey blinked in disbelief at her father's nonchalant attitude. She winced and stood back. Her hand throbbed as though it was listening to their conversation. Please, Dad, it hurts a ton. Yeah, well, you shouldn't have waited to tell me, he said. Aubrey knew she wouldn't get out of this conversation without at least a verbal lashing or slap across the face. She decided at that moment to be completely honest about what was happening to her. There's something else, Dad. What? You're not going to believe me when I say it. What? What do you mean? Aubrey took a deep breath and stepped away from him. Previous times he'd hit her it was because she'd been too close while trying to speak to him. If she stayed a few steps away, she might be able to run to her room and lock the door this time. He'd bang on it a little while, but then get tired and go back to drinking. It's just really hard to believe, she said. Just fucking tell me, Aubrey, he yelled. It shook the house more than the thunder. I'm... I'm... Every night since I was bit by the cat, bugs have been coming into my room and... She started to cry. And stealing me, she whispered. What? What the fuck are you talking about? Bugs! They're coming into my room and taking me to Hidden Oaks. She broke down even further, falling to her knees and sobbing. They... They won't leave me alone. Her father stood up alarmed and walked over to her. She was the same height as he was, but... When she was on her knees, he was taller, and it reminded her of when she was a kid, before her mom died, how he'd pick her up when he got home from work and walk up the driveway. Aubrey lifted her wounded hand, which quivered like a broken building, and opened it. A few of the insects crawled out of her bandaged palm and dropped out onto the floor. See? She sobbed. Her father slowly put his hands over the shivering shoulders and pulled her to her feet. It was a slow, delicate operation that made her cry even harder. There, he said, once they were face to face. Aubrey smiled. Then he slapped her. It was a hard one, enough for her to taste blood in the right corner of her mouth. It would leave a hint of purple on her face. It hadn't been the first time. A year or two ago, she'd missed the bus and she had to call her dad at work. When he picked her up to take her in, he belittled her about how stupid she was for the entire ride. In tears, Aubrey finally said, Enough, okay? I'm sorry, you've won. I get it, I'm a failure. In one quick movement, he slapped her with his right hand while driving, even without looking away from the road. It left a handprint on her face. A teacher had put makeup on it later that morning. To this day, Aubrey hated that act of kindness. This time, Aubrey pushed her father away from her in a surprising feat of strength. He tripped over a box of beer bottles and crashed onto the floor. The rattle of empty glass echoed everywhere. She'd run to her room in a second. This would infuriate him. He'd want to hit her more. She could get away, though. He was too disoriented to follow her effectively. You know, Mom never would have loved you if you didn't have some good in you. She wouldn't be with the person you are now, Aubrey said. She spit blood on the floor. Why couldn't you stay kind for me? She said, running to her room before he could get to his feet. The rest of the evening the thunderstorm raged. Aubrey listened for her father to knock on the door to talk to her. He hadn't in the past, but she'd never stood up to him before. She was hoping this would change him, wake him up, and she'd be able to tell him about what was happening to her. Outside her window the rain clicked on the glass like little claws. The dark trees would occasionally bend to the stormy breezes, making her hopeful that her house would just blow away. She felt the bruise forming on her face and blinked a few tears away. She stared at the floor. One of the bugs darted between a few piles of clothes. Fine. Take me, she whispered, before sobbing herself to sleep. That night, after the storms had mostly wandered away, they came inside for her. She didn't struggle or wake. The sadness of her slumber was enough to mute them sliding beneath her like a living blanket. They lifted her up, opened the window with their thousands of little legs, and effortlessly glided her down onto the lawn. The dog barked downstairs as though it knew something was happening. 
The black scrambling clouds split in half without letting her body touch the grass, while the other portion scattered back into the house. The dog's bark soon turned to yelps and howls as it was bitten, torn, and tortured into silence. They got her to the park in less than five minutes. Nobody was out. They always waited for the perfect pause at the devil's hour to move her. Tonight was no different. They passed the wooden sign sitting outside Hidden Oaks in an inky streak. A deer crossed the street closer to the church. It only stopped for a second to watch the girl glide past. She was part of their world now. The dark gates beyond the natural. The animal wanted nothing to do with it, or its life might be jeopardized. Instead of holding Aubrey down outside the woods, the insects just let her sleep next to its dark edge, until the trees parted and the shadowy shape drifted out, like a piece of the night were alive. It floated over in a few glides and settled above her. A song played somewhere, and it vanished from the insect's sight. They lined up and watched, waiting like an audience. But the battle for the girl had shifted to the inside of her mind. Aubrey was still asleep, but she was cognizant of what was happening outside her body. The bugs had taken her, just like she had told them to. Now her mind was trapped in a circle of darkness. The closer she got to the forest, the more it started to spin and oscillate until she felt like she was falling through some sort of portal. Then it all melted away from her like candle wax. She was back in the prairie from before, the wild fields of wheat and flour, the sky, the same blue. It was so clear it felt like it was crushing her. The air smelled alive with pollen. In front of her, down from the rolling hills of fibrous gold, was the cobblestone bridge curled over the river. Her right arm suddenly reached for it, without her consent. Pain filled her skin, like something was growing inside of her bicep. She could feel flesh parting and could smell blood. The bridge seemed to shrink as she reached for it, like a photo being manipulated. The more she stared, the more it was apparent that the bridge was tightening around her arm in some abstract twist of rock and moss. Pretty soon she was next to the structure as her arm started to mix into it like clay. She was in the shallow waters of the river. She could feel the bubbling on her toes of currents on rocks. There was a pinch in her arm, and then something ripped like paper. The pain woke her up in a jump. She was on the grass, but she wasn't completely there. Her right arm was gone, completely severed, leaving a red trail of uneven tissue dangling out of her shoulder like an animal's tail. Blood was flowing everywhere. Her body was seizing up in shock, and she couldn't find her breath. The bugs ran down to help her to try and stop the bleeding coursing from her wound. They piled over it trying to clot the flow, but couldn't. In a while, after her body had succumbed to shock, Aubrey was dead. Before she died, she managed to whisper one word to stars weeping back at her from the night sky. Mom, she whispered. Killing the girl wasn't what the bugs wanted. They were reluctant to go back to their forest. She had lied to them about what she wanted. Now the human was dead, and she was closer to being free. The earwigs had been tricked. Long after this grisly affair, before dawn broke and an unlucky passerby would find the lifeless body of Aubrey on the hill outside the forest, a black sedan pulled up quietly next to the park. Two men unceremoniously grabbed the body and threw it in the trunk like a piece of lumber. One shook his head. The other started to cry as he bent down and picked up the lost shoe, which he placed in after her. The Hidden Oaks Podcast is a collaboration between Patrick W. Marsh, Robert Dawn, and Owen Swerkstrom. Agency was written by Owen Swerkstrom, Black Sedans by Robert Dawn, and Earwig by Patrick W. Marsh. The voice of Hidden Oaks and Agent Wilker performed by Robert Dawn. The voice of Agent Matson performed by Chris Gildy. Original music composed and performed by David Schwartz. 
Find more of his works at dtschwartz.com. Produced by Robert Don, Owen Swerkstrom, and Patrick W. Marsh. You can find out more online by visiting us at hiddenoakspodcast.com or by finding us on Twitter at Hidden Oaks Pod, as well as Facebook and Instagram at Hidden Oaks Podcast. Hidden Oaks is an Ironfield independent production. Thank you for listening, and until next time.